This is Duke University. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Maggie Monis. I'm at UDF here in our Raleigh office and I work on agriculture and water, water quality policy but have also been doing some habitat work along with my colleague Amy Chow. Today we're fortunate to have David Wolf, our fearless habitat leader in UDF. <laughs> habitat credit exchange concept for a long time and it's really starting to take off. Um, there are a lot of upcoming listings of species that could have real implications for development, energy production, etc. And um, I think he'll talk about how this is a model to deal with that in a way that really protects species um, but also is a little bit more flexible. So with that. Thank you Maggie. Go ahead. <coughs> okay. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about um, what we've called various things, but our latest iteration is calling them wildlife habitat exchanges. Maggie mentioned credit systems, credit trading systems. It's all with under all under the the kind of overarching concept of payment for ecosystem services. So you know, a type of, a way of compensating, especially private landowners, because so many endangered species have so much habitat on private land. Some estimates put it above 70% of the habitat for endangered species is on private land. So that's been a big part of our focus. And, and finding a way to compensate these landowners for participating in the, the recovery of those species. I'm gonna start out by talking, or saying a little bit about work we've done with an endangered songbird. This is the golden cheek warbler uh, that lives in oak juniper habitat in central Texas, about 30 to 35 counties or so through central Texas is the breeding range for this species. So it breeds only in Texas and it's a neotropical migrant. So it spends the winters down in um, Central America, highlands of Central America primarily. This is the kind of habitat it, it lives in in central Texas, mature oak juniper woodlands in what's called the hill country of central Texas. Some people think of Texas as this big expansive plain of deserts and all, but actually there's some really interesting places uh, in central Texas with these, this kind of topography. So that's the habitat for that bird. Fort Hood is one of the largest military installations in the world. It's 220,000 acres or so in central Texas and so it's plopped down there in the eastern part of the breeding range and this is the kind of stuff that goes on at Fort Hood every day, day in, day out. It's one of the primary locations for mechanized training. That means tanks and stuff with, you know, heavy armor and wheels and, um, you know, lots of things being shot out of cannons and artillery and so on, um, as well as foot training. And this is where the golden cheek warbler lives <coughs> on Fort Hood. And there's actually 5,000 pairs of the bird on Fort Hood. So even though there's all this training activity going on, there's something like 50,000 acres of habitat. Almost like one out of every four acres on Fort Hood is habitat for this bird. And over the past decade, um, actually 15 years or so, training pressure has been increasing on Fort Hood as well as a lot of other military installations um, because of the two wars that had been going on. And so that, that increased training pressure has kind of pushed training up to where it's bumping up against habitat more and more frequently. So, you know, the military has done a great job of managing for that bird. They, they've manage the habitat they have well, but then they were starting to bump up against, you know, they need more training space, need more training space. So um, in 2004, Fort Hood came to EDF and some of the other partners we work with and say, we, you know, we need a way to get more training flexibility to be able to put some soldiers in habitat and, and take them out. They weren't necessarily wanting to mow over habitat so they could drive tanks through. They needed more space for foot troops to get into and, and train. So it was a situation where they weren't going to destroy habitat, but they might impact it for short terms. And they, they needed a, a, a way to, to solve that problem of, 
uh, of impacting habitat because there's a federal agency, they're dealing with a federally listed bird, they have an obligation under law to manage for the benefit of that species. So we said, um, you have 5,000 pairs on Fort Hood, we only know of about 1,000 pairs in the whole rest of that range. We need to start working with private landowners to get more, more lands engaged in conservation so that we don't have you know, this entire population wrapped up on one army base that's getting more training pressure. So we developed something called the Fort Hood uh, Recovery Credit System, and this is essentially what it does. Um, it gets private landowners engaged. By Fort Hood pays them for conservation actions to benefit the species, and in return, Fort Hood gets a, a credit that they can use, and when they have training activities, they can debit those credits to offset their impacts on the base. That, that's the general idea. So, the, and the goal is to get a lot more conservation happening on private lands, because most of that 30 county area outside of Fort Hood is private. So if we're gonna conserve that species across the range, we've gotta get those private landowners engaged in conservation. And this was a way to do it, uh, which both benefited the private landowners and benefited the bird by more conservation actions going on outside the base. And it gave Fort Hood more flexibility for training um, on their, their base. Um, this, I, I got a series of slides that kind of shows, and I hope this is dark enough, I guess we could turn off the lights if you can't see it. But how, you know, how did this work on a private ranch? So what we would do to get private landowners in, engaged in this process They'd have to have a, a certain minimum amount of existing habitat, and they'd have to be part of it. All this dark area is oak juniper woodlands that supports the warbler. And you can see areas have been opened up for, for, um, uh, for farming, for ranching, you know, lots of fragmentation on the landscape, kind of a typical landscape. And so to get those private landowners engaged, uh, we would put biologists down the ground to identify areas that need enhancement or restoration to create uh, additional habitat, to fill in gaps, to defragment the landscape. You know, those areas were identified uh, and, and as well as what was going on in the surrounding landscape. And so a plan would be put together for those landowners as to what they had to do to generate credits. You've got to enhance some habitat, you've got to expand some habitat, and, and that would be quantified into credits. Uh, and then the, the, the landowners uh, that then had those credits would actually come together and, and do a reverse auction, you know, bid to sell their credits to the military. The landowners actually competed to sell their credits to the military. There was enough interest, um, there was enough supply, so to speak, of credits that they would, they would bid against each other to sell the credits. And th the program was set up uh, where landowners could enroll anywhere from 10 to 25 year terms. And the idea of that was these impacts on Fort Hood, putting troops into habitat, were short term. It might happen for a few years, then troops would come out and the habitat's still usable for the birds. So we, we enrolled landowners for the terms that would reflect how much of an impact over time Fort Hood was having on that habitat um, to offset that impact. Plus we added a kind of a net benefit requirement. They had to uh, debit m more credits than they were actually impacting on Fort Hood. Well, the interesting thing was in, in the bid process, uh, we had eight bid rounds. So this is over a three-year pilot period uh, of the program. Uh, the red line shows the, the cost per what we call recovery credit year. We figured out their credits, we multiplied it by their, their term of engagement, and we called that a credit year. It started out really high for that, that credit year, and then when the, when the competition started kicking in, that price dropped and it stayed down. So the, the, the market drove the cost of the credits down for Fort Hood. And that, oh, I, hey there, <laughs> come on in. So what this means is that Fort Hood got the, the most conservation or the most credits for their dollar by using that, that market price to, to drive this, drive the cost of that, that, those conservation actions or credits down. And that was a real eye opener for us as to the the power of having landowners compete to sell credits that represent conservation actions. And then on, on, the, 
on the term side, at the beginning, all these landowners who are fairly conservative folks, they, they didn't want to make big commitments, so they all wanted to do 10-year commitments, kind of minimize their commitments. But then they, they quickly discovered that if they were willing to do longer-term agreements, um, you know, as much as, as 25 years, they had more to sell. They had more of a commodity to sell. So th they started increasing their commitments as time went by. At the, and at the end, all of them were going in at 25 years, and several were asking, can we do more? Can we do 30? Can we do 35 years? So the lesson there was, for you know, even for landowners who are really sketchy about getting involved in endangered species conservation, once you kind of get them in the door, get them comfortable with the program, you have the opportunity to start moving them towards longer-term conservation because what we really want to create is sustainability and as much permanency in, in sustaining these species as possible on the landscape. But in the West, at least, a lot of these farmers and ranchers at least from the outset, they're not going to do a permanent easement. They'll tell you, no way, not doing it. They'll, they'll do a term agreement, but they're not going to do permanent. But we find over time that a subset of them will, will move towards longer term agreements, and some of them will consider permanent after they've done a term agreement. So you got to kind of think long term about getting these folks engaged uh, in conservation. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. That pilot project at Fort Hood ran from uh, 2006, the summer of 2006, <coughs> to the summer of 2009. And we learned a lot of lessons from that. Uh, you know, getting the, those kinds of landowners engaged in conservation, that worked really well. Um, and the power of the market, that was another strong lesson to us. So we have now at EDF, our, our land, water, and wildlife program, we have, have moved towards a strategy of building these kinds of credit systems or wildlife habitat exchanges across the landscape. We feel that is a really powerful way to leverage what, what, what are always going to be limited resource on the conservation side, limited staff, limited money. Uh, the fact that public dollars are going down for conservation, that's not going to change anytime soon. So we've got to find ways to leverage private resources if we're going to do expansive landscape scale conservation in the West. <clears throat> so we are engaged in these kinds of efforts, and I'm going to go into some details on exactly what these efforts are, a couple of examples at least. Uh, but I wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of, of where we are working in the West. Uh, I'm going to talk a fair amount about lesser prairie chicken in the southern Great Plains. Uh, you know, we talked about Fort Hood. We're taking the Fort Hood example and now looking at expanding that concept to a bigger part of Texas, um, you know, roughly 80 counties or so, uh, and including some other endangered species beyond the golden sheep warbler in that market. Uh, I have a colleague, Ted Toombs, who's working in Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, two different programs there. They're state-based uh, with a lot of focus on the greater sage grouse. <clears throat> Both the lesser prairie chicken uh, and greater sage grouse, those two grouse species, grassland-dependent species, non-migratory, um, you know, grassland birds in general are one of the most imperiled groups of, of species on the planet, uh, and that's no different for lesser prairie chicken and greater sage grouse. Plus, we've got just an enormous amount of energy development going on in the West, so potentials for conflict there. Number of, of programs going on in California, both species and water related, and I'm not going to, just for time restraints, not going to spend any time on those today. Here, here's a, a lovely bird, I think, a lesser prairie chicken. And just wanted to point out that why we're doing this is because we're confident that these kinds of approaches are going to get us better outcomes for the species. And we are committed to substantially engaging working landowners, farmers, ranchers, forest landowners in conservation in, in a sustainable way. That's a big goal of, of EDF as well. So I want to jump in and uh, get into a little bit of detail on what we're doing with a lesser prairie chicken. This species, it was a candidate for listing for over a decade. And then as a result uh, of recent um, lawsuit settlement with Center for Biological Diversity, um, 
there's another group I forgot, Forest Guardians, or I forget what the other group's called exactly. But anyway, uh, several hundred species that have been sitting on the candidate list for years. You know, the law says the service is supposed to review them and make a decision on them in a timely manner. Well, uh, <coughs> as a result of the lawsuit settlement, they're now under, Fish and Wildlife Service is now under court order to make a decision by set dates for several hundred species. Uh, so the lesser prairie chickens on that list, greater sage grouse is on that list, a whole bunch of aquatic species in the southeast are on that list, and there are now dates certain within the next three years or so where the service has to make a decision if what these things are either they're not going to be listed or they're on the list. Um, they can't be um, put in that kind of limbo category anymore for years and years. So last November, November 2012, the service proposed that the chicken be listed as threatened, so put on the list, basically. And threatened is not really that much different from endangered um, unless you invoke something called the 4D rule, which provides exemption, can provide some exemptions for, for agricultural folks and other folks, but that's to be determined whether that's going to be invoked just yet. But anyway... Um, it, it's, it's now been proposed for threatened. The, the final decision has to be made by this September as to whether it goes on the list or not. And given that there's all this energy development, oil and gas and wind going on across the range of the chicken, it could have a huge, it will have a huge impact on oil and gas development if it's listed. So this is a place that needs a solution for conserving this species while allowing for responsible energy development. But just an example of, of kind of what's been happening in that landscape. In 96, here's a section of land, 640 acres in North Texas, that was native prairie supported lesser prairie chickens. And then uh, in 2004, or by 2004, oil and gas pads, the roads that connect them, had fragmented that landscape, and the chicken cannot live in that landscape. It doesn't really, I mean, even if you had patches of native grassland in between, it doesn't tolerate roads, vertical structures. It just doesn't adapt well to human infrastructure. Some species do, some don't. The chicken is one that does not. Uh, it needs large blocks of unfragmented uh, native grasslands, <coughs> essentially. So typically, what, you know, what would an energy company do to, to mitigate their impacts for this species? Um, there's a variety of, of ways that they do that right now. A company can, can themselves set aside a piece of land to offset their footprint in one place. You know, they can just buy another piece of land to offset that or pay a, pay a landowner to do conservation for the species at some other location. That's what we call permitting responsible. There's the concept of conservation banking where either a landowner or a, a for-profit entity, an actual banker, can buy a piece of property and then sell credits to the energy company to offset their impacts. Uh, it's actually you know, a for-profit business in some places. It's, it's been used uh, quite a bit in California. There's a, about 100 conservation banks in California. Uh, but there's only eight or ten or so across the rest of the country. California has some pretty stringent state endangered species laws, and they actually pay attention to them, And uh, in addition to having a lot of listed species. So it's been pretty active in California, not so much across the rest of the country, so there's, there's limitations there. And then something called in-lieu fee, where the energy company just kind of pays into a, a pot of money that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service oversees and with the idea there being that the Fish and Wildlife Service will at some point pay for a conservation project to supposedly offset the, the impact. Um, it, the limitation there is you, yes, Lydia. Um, for species, I, my, my knowledge, I'm not, I don't have extensive knowledge of, of it, but my experience is it's fairly limited. Um, in use, um, I, I can't tell you how many species. Or I mean, in Texas, I can only think of one example. There's an endangered toad, the Houston toad, where where in lieu fee has been used. And in that case, um, whoever was impacting the habitat, the subdivision developer, whomever, sent money to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to go in a pot for projects. 
the problem there in most cases is whatever those projects are that kind of create conservation benefit, there's often no way to compare them to the impact. So we're not sure if we're actually offsetting that impact completely, much less creating a net benefit. So with all these approaches, you know, there are, there are various limitations which, you know, for us indicate we need another solution that's at, at a much higher level of environmental accountability uh, where the rules are consistent, where we've got structure. Um, and we're calling this kind of next generation mitigation. And so here's a list of, of some of those reasons as to why we are moving in this direction. Um, create that, that consistency, and especially, this is really important, quantifying both the impacts uh, and, and the, the conservation actions that are supposed to offset those impacts so that we can make direct comparisons of those two and then add on a net benefit because it, it, it's in everyone's benefit to put these species on a positive trajectory, hopefully to keep them off the list because that means avoided regulation. But if we can't do that, at least to put them on a positive trajectory to recover them quickly so that they can come off the list at, in some reasonable period of time. Uh, creating permanence of conservation across the landscape, and that doesn't necessarily mean permanent easements all over the place, which is not real, really realistic in a private lands landscape like this because landowners aren't going to, most of them aren't going to do it anyway. Uh, plus you've got other things happening like climate change, which we're, we're already seeing shifts north in this species. So if we've got a bunch of permanent easements down here in the south and in 20 years the chicken has, has moved north, then, then what value do those uh, permanent easements have? So being very um, smart about using term agreements which we can shift over the landscape over time, allow those that are losing their conservation value to lapse while we're signing up new landowners in places that where the priority has increased uh, in terms of conservation need of the species. <coughs> Paying landowners for outcomes, you know, when you improve the habitat, we'll measure that as a credit and that's what you get paid for. Instead of paying them to implement a practice which we think is going to benefit the habitat. Um, and I'll just move quickly through some of these. Um, we've talked about net benefits. Economies of scale is a big one. Um, if you're just doing one little individual project here, one there, the cost related to management and monitoring of any individual project can be relatively high. But with these wildlife habitat exchanges, we'll be administering those across the range of the species, across many millions <coughs> of acres. So there'll be centralized um, roles that, that uh, implement management and monitoring across potentially hundreds of properties so that the, the cost for management and monitoring for any one site will be relatively small and we can capture those economies of scale. Building these wildlife habitat exchanges, and I'm using the lesser prairie chicken uh, example here, is a committee-based process and we have typically used uh, two committees and we've involved all the stakeholders, landowners, the farmers and ranchers who live in the area get to come to the table and offer their opinions and concerns and issues uh, as well as the energy companies. So we've got folks like Exxon is at the table. They, they're operating within the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. You know, they, they want to be a part of designing the system uh, because, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for, for EDF to kind of design a system and then start going to farmers and ranchers and saying, well, we figured out this great system, it's really good, you know, you should participate if they haven't had a voice at the table. Um, we've learned that from experience. So getting those stakeholder groups to the table as well as, you know, our environmental partners to help craft these systems is key. And we, we've used a two-committee-based uh, process, a science committee, to figure out what those credits and debits should be. How do we measure an adverse impact? How do we measure the conservation benefits uh, so that we compare those two? What science is available to, to develop those uh, measures? That's a key role for the science committee. Then the policy committee designs things like protocols, the rules for how a landowner participates, how an energy company participates, what is the structure for the exchange, who's going to fill what roles. Um, all those pieces are, 
are designed by the policy committee. And we're developing kind of a template for how this should work so that uh, when we get this design for the lesser prairie chicken, um, and actually we've got effort going on for the greater sage grouse at the same time, we can then build templates and models that other groups can use for other species uh, to, to help provide some guidance across the country. This provides a, this graphic provides a general structure of how these things look. So we've got on the impact side, you know, the buyers are typically energy companies in this landscape. We've got the landowners who they've got the existing habitat, they've got potential habitat. Those are the folks who can generate credits. There'll be some type of central administration role, and there's there's a lot more detail to this box, um, wh which I can I can show you. I'm not going to do it in this presentation, but we've got information that because when the landowner generates a credit, someone measures that credit, someone else verifies that credit value. There's an independent verification that credit's registered. So there's a whole series of steps to actually get a credit to the point where it can be sold, and everyone's confident, yes, it's got value. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the regulatory agency um, that will support this type of approach. So we've got credits coming from landowners, the demand coming from energy, dollars flowing this way to landowners. And in terms of, of regulatory support for operating this system, we have two basic types of agreements, what we call a range-wide habitat exchange agreement. And that uh, basically supports uh, the credit side, the positive side of this equation. So that enables landowners to generate credits uh, and to sell them for mitigation purposes to energy companies. Then on the impact side, uh, we have what we're using as a, a combination CCAA8CP. Uh, this is a candidate conservation agreement with assurances along with a habitat conservation plan. I'm not going to drill down into too much detail, but um, I, I can answer questions on it afterwards. This is basically a, a document, uh, a permit side document from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it sell, tells energy companies that if you participate uh, in, in buying credits now before this species is finally on the endangered species list, those credits will have value to you even if the species is listed. So it gives them operational certainty. For the landowners, it, it says, you know, if you're generating credits, you've got that obligation to generate those credits and maintain them. But if the species is listed, we're not going to pile anything additional on top of that for you. So it provides them some regulatory certainty uh, as well. The, the wildlife habitat exchanges are all about improving the situation or creating uplift in conservation for the species. So this whole process of, of creating credits kind of goes like this. So the landowners generate the credits. They're, they're verified by an independent entity. They're, they're registered so they can be tracked after their, or, or to make them ready to be exchanged with the energy companies. Um, they can then be sold. We, we monitor the results. Did we actually create the credits? Uh, and, and are they being maintained? Um, are there things happening that we hadn't predicted that can affect credit value? And so we've got adaptive management built in as well. Because over time, there'll be new science. We may change some of the practices we're doing. The actual way we measure credits may have to be changed um, in the future. So we provide that adaptive capability. Uh, benefits for farmers and ranchers. Well, one is that they get they get a say in the process, and they, they very much appreciate that. And it creates a new conservation commodity, so to speak, for them to sell. So they can enter this into their business equation. Uh, that they'll have the opportunity to ranch for chickens as opposed to ranching for cows. And it may be a very competitive option for them. We want it to be a competitive option for them. You know, if they can make the same or a little bit more, more money growing native grassland to benefit the lesser prairie chicken as opposed to raising cows, some of those folks are going to make the switch. They will definitely do that. And most of these operators of ranches and farms, you know, most of them, a good portion of them, are interested in wildlife. And so they, they like to have the opportunity for another potential source of income. So it gives them some flexibility. Uh, 
and we talked about the reduced regulatory risk by participating in this program as well. On the business side, and I should say about wind, I mean, there's a wind turbine uh, farm there in the background. If you, if you look at a map of the United States and you look at where the wind potential is, it's in the Great Plains. That's where, that's where most of the wind potential in the U.S. is. Texas is already number one in terms of gener generation of wind power in the United States, and more is coming. But, I mean, it's great to have a renewable source of energy like that, but then you've got all those grassland-dependent species in the Great Plains, so you've got the potential for conflict from, from having turbines here. And turbines do not kill lesser prairie chickens directly. They don't fly <laughs> that high, generally. But they avoid them. They, they, they avoid vertical structures. And some people think that's because they view it as a raptor perch. You know, so a tree or anything sticking up in the landscape is they, they, they give it a wide berth. So it, it does create an impact for that species by making big areas unsuitable for them, unfortunately. But there are, there are lots of reasons why businesses are interested in this. And we've got, you know, I mentioned Exxon. We've got a lot of other companies at the table who are super motivated to participate in this because they, they realize what the impact of a listing of lesser prairie chicken is going to have on them. So they've got the potential to, to do some proactive conservation by investing in credits right now and potentially keep that bird off the list if we get enough conservation going on private lands. Um, so it, it, it has the potential to re reduce their risk. Um, even if it is listed, they'll still have certainty because those credits have value in the post-listing environment. Um, there's all these other reasons that, that you know, they can get faster approval for their projects if they're participating. It's cost efficient because, again, landowners are going to compete to sell those credits. So these companies will get the most, most credits for their dollars invested. Um, <coughs> several other reasons that I'm, I'm just going to let you look at here and keep moving. So I wanted to talk about how, we, how we're measuring credits. This is kind of the interesting sciency part of the work. <coughs> typically with mitigation, with something like a, a conservation bank for a species, they'll typically, the, the typical measure will be acreage. You know, if there's an impact of 100 acres by an energy company in one place, then the Fish and Wildlife Service would, would say, well, you got to offset that with 150 or 200 acres by buying those acres from a bank. But we all know that acres for species in one place are not necessarily equivalent in terms of the value to the species of 100 acres somewhere else. So we're looking at, at measuring factors which reflect the quality of, of habitat to a particular species and looking at the functionality or, or functional acres concept. So <coughs> in this example, say we've got 100 acres of habitat for the lesser prairie chicken. It's perfect habitat. It's 100% functional. Couldn't be any better. We call that 100 functional acres for the species. Then if we get a project come in, say a transmission line, they, they bulldoze 10 acres to put in the line. Well, they've had, clearly they've had 10 acres of direct impact there. And with a typical mitigation approach, they might be required to offset that with a, a factor, by a factor of two or three. So they might be, have an obligation to mitigate with 20 to 30 acres of, of restoration. Uh, or purchase some credits from a bank. But if we actually measure the functionality of that habitat and look at it from the perspective of the lesser prairie chicken and how it's changed, yes, we've lost 10 acres. That's gone to zero function. But the other 90 acres, because the bird may be avoiding it, may be reduced to 20% of its original function. And there are things on the landscape we can measure to determine that. So what we're actually left with of that 100 functional acres is now 18. So we do the math there, and the actual debit is 82 functional acres, not, not 20 or 30 acres. Here's, here's what the company is actually impacted. So we'll want them to, to offset with that 82 functional acres and plus add a net benefit to the species. Again, status quo is not good enough. Status quo will, will ensure that the species goes on the endangered species list. Adding a net benefit will put it on a, on a positive trajectory. How do, we, how do we figure out those percentages and the credit values and all? We, we, we're, we're actually working with a consulting firm, Parametrics, um, that they have expertise in building these kinds of measures. 
and, and don't worry, there won't be a test on this at the end, but they go through the process of building these concept models with a scientist, you know, identifying what are the characteristics of the habitat that are important to the species for, for breeding habitat, summer habitat, winter habitat. Uh, we have science which tells us, you know, what are the aspects and attributes of the habitat, canopy cover, presence of certain species that are very important to the quality of habitat for a species. So we go through an exercise of creating these concept models, identifying the very, those various attributes that are in that model, defining those attributes, then how do we measure those? How are those measured on the landscape? Well, because we're going to have to measure those things to calculate credits. And what is the science that backs that up? Because these things, you know, the, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service op operates in a very litigious environment. I mean, the fact that we're dealing with lesser prairie chickens is a result of a lawsuit that's pushed it now to the, the brink of listing. All these things are questioned by various groups. You know, how did you make this decision? How did you make that decision? So you have to document everything about your mitigation process. And so we, we have developed a process for doing <coughs> that which explains all the reasoning behind how do we measure these credits? How do we come up with all these numbers? And so we, we come up with these, these scoring curves of, of these factors like canopy cover. It's important to lesser prairie chicken. Well, how important is it? Well, the scientists say it's got a linear relationship in a normal year. That, you know, a high, a high level of canopy cover is very important to the species. On a scale of 0 to 10, 100% canopy cover is a 10. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because we've also got situations where dry years, wet years, that, that's going to change the value of things like, like canopy cover. Canopy cover becomes much more important to the species in, in drier years. The science can tell us that. And I'm not going to dig down to the numbers. I'm just showing this as an example that um, you know, we, we, can, we can link these various attributes and indicate their, their level of, of performance to the species, dry years, normal years, years wet years. We come up with these scoring tables. All that is entered into a calculation of how we calculate credits. And, figure out what is the functionality of 100 acres, particular 100 acres. Is it 100% functional, 50% functional? Um, we have the science to, to determine that. <coughs> uh, where we are in working with the lesser prairie chicken, uh, we, we've got that committee-based process going on right now. Uh, we, we expect to finalize the design, the metrics I just talked about those various regulatory agreements within the next uh, six to eight weeks or so. And then this summer, we expect to initiate transactions with private landowners uh, on this. Some of the key challenges, um, it, it's interesting bringing farmers and ranchers, Exxon, other energy companies, uh, conservation groups, you know, the, the Nature Conservancy is working with us, Ply Lakes Joint Venture, all into the same room and, and try to figure out how to make a system like this works, like, you know, make it work. Uh, the, the, the farmers and ranchers have, have one set of interests, and even between themselves, uh, often different opinions on how something should work, who gets the most credits, where the priority areas are, um, you know, who, who's going to handle the permits. Just a long list of, of issues that you got to, create a balance amongst all the stakeholders there and ensure that we're creating the net benefit for the species in the end. Uh, the, the, the permit side documents have to go through a National Environmental Policy Act review and in, environmental impact statement. We're dealing with a five-state range here, millions of acres. So, you know, there's, there's lots of potential uh, other environmental impacts that need to be evaluated, so it's expensive and timely to kind of tack on this NEPA process, as it's called. Uh, you know, we're trying to move quickly to have a positive influence on the listing decision in September, but this is a real challenge when you've got other requirements like that. Um, landowner confidentiality is a big issue with, with farmers and ranchers in the West. Uh, 
they're, they're very concerned about their information or information on their places about, about a rare species being available to a government agency like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're, we're trying to find the right balance between maintaining some level of landowner confidentiality because we need large numbers of landowners to participate. And if we can't guarantee them some degree of confidentiality, then we're, we're not going to get that level of participation. But on the other side, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and a lot of environmental groups want to make sure that what's going on here is actually happening in terms of conservation benefit for the species. So that's, that's a challenging balance. Uh, one uh, suggestion a couple days ago was to uh, allow the service to come into the administrator's office for the program and actually see all the details of where the conservation is happening, even, you know, specific ranches and ranch names, but not be able to take any paper out of the, the office because they're worried about, you know, if the Fish and Wildlife Service takes a document out and copies it, then it can be FOIA'd and anyone can get it. So it's, it's a really tricky balance there, but it's a huge issue that we have to solve. Um, seed funding to, to get the initial credits generated to start selling to companies, because you've got a lot of companies here who are interested, but they're kind of all waiting to see who acts first, who's going to put that first million in or two million or whatever. So that's, that's kind of a lesser one, but it's still a challenge. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.